All right, friends, this week I am back to uh, regular health. I will no longer be confused. So if, you know, last week was a little bit of a sticky episode for me, I'm back. I have no excuse this time. So there's maybe a little bit more pressure. Um, but, you know, the response seemed to be pretty good to the to the injury episode. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, strength and specifically what strength is, what it isn't really some, some, maybe some myth busting stuff. And then specifically, um, whether or not strength is useful to use as a sort of, um, metric in the context of hypertrophy. And then we'll talk about some different contexts, beginners, advanced people, uh, enhanced people, natural people, maybe how it applies to different settings and how that changes. Cause Ethan obviously have you know a lot of experience with that personally and anecdotally. So, I kind of wanted to start out with just some definitions, kind of like we we did last time. And strength is a very, very broad term. We often use it in, a, in the kind of like a colloquial relative sense. We say like this person is strong or this person is weak or I am getting stronger. Um, but Ethan, from a kind of like more objective standpoint, how do you kind of think about strength in terms of just like a 30,000 foot definition that we can kind of like, you know, start off um, from? How do you kind of define strength? You're, you 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 start today. I'm coming into this. Blank. Okay. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> well, the def- seven, seven weeks out. You just like you know, don't hit me with the uh, the big broad questions. Today. Okay. Fine. Fine. Um. So I personally like to think about strength, at least from uh, a a broad definition standpoint as just something it's basically like a number that we measure in a particular context and i call that number output right so for example um strength is something that's very difficult at least personally to define outside of a context meaning that like if i you know am doing a bench press right and i can do um 315 for one Okay. Back, back in my day, you know, I hit a 375, you know, for a pause, whatever, you know, powerlifting days, uh, you got pretty strong. But when someone asked me like, Hey, how, you know, how strong is your bench press? We typically say a number. And so I think that's still a good starting point to, to begin from, or to, to begin with in that when we talk about strength broadly, we're really referring to specific quantifiable metrics such as what is the weight on the bar or what is the weight on the stack? That's really how we represent strength. But strength is always specific to a given context, right? So, um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about many contexts, but just to give one, it's like even just taking the bench press example, many power lifters know, oh, look, we have a, we have a live podcast listener. Funny, funny you should, uh, funny you should bring that up today. Yeah, one for one. So, um, you know, even in the context of a bench press, right? Like, if you go from doing your normal competition grip, whatever we're calling competition grip, you know, um, wrists stacked over forearms, stacked over elbows, the kind of typical setup. Um, and and then you change that grip, right? Or you change the tempo. You change one thing about the way that you're doing the exercise. All of a sudden, the output of that exercise looks very different. So let's say you're doing a competition bench where you're forced to pause, right? Versus uh, a bench where you're kind of like bouncing the barbell off your chest. Both of those things we call a bench press, but most people can bench more where they're not performing a pause. So broad picture, I think of strength as this metric that we measure. And that metric is specific to an exercise. And when we go sort of you know, forward from here, we can talk about how um, strength is also specific to rep range and those kinds of things. But um, I think it's something that's very, very broad. And so that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it because it's always going to be so specific to, to scenario. Um, but I think again, super wide view, I think it's good to think about it as a metric that is specific to scenario. And oftentimes I just refer to that as output, um, really just the stuff we can kind of measure looking at an exercise, you know, um, or one exercise variation of a potential, you know, infinite amount. So does anything come up for you? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, as you know, like th- this is the type of conversation we've had both in person and also just kind of in those back and forth texts where we try to create some really pedantic definition on something that like doesn't miss any variable. And you know, you'll send me a text with a definition. I'll refine it, send it back <laughs> to you. 
So, you know, I know it's it's in the archives of, of my brain, but like I mentioned, you know, this point in prep kind of immediately like, uh, you know, diving into that cave and sort of like trying to pull out that one file uh, is like, eh, I don't know if that, you know, <clears throat> that amount of energy uh, exists at this moment in time. But when, once you kind of like, you know, shine a light into the cave for me, it's like, okay, I remember these conversations like. Uh, there's, you know, so many different files in there, but I can start to, you know, once we kind of get to a, a particular area of that cabinet or that cave, so to speak, I can start to, you know, reference things and, and give some more context, right? So I think the number one thing, like you said, is, is specificity. You know, when someone comes up to me on the street, you know, depending on how well-versed they are in sort of physique or strength sport, they might ask a question like, how strong are you? Or they might ask a question like, how much do you bench press? How much, you know, do you squat? Right. And none of those are specific, but at least the exercise is a little bit more specific. Right. Now I start to have a picture of like, all right. I mean, when someone asks me how much I bench press, they're probably not talking about a dumbbell. They're probably talking about a barbell. Most contexts, they're talking about what I can do for one rep. So now we have greater specificity. But as you mentioned, there's also like, is it, you know, one rep where the constraint is touching my chest, you know, and of course, you know, my chest versus someone else's chest versus, you know, the length of different segments, you know, of, of my arm, you know, all play into the appearance of this thing that we call strength. Um, so I think a lot of times when we're talking about strength, we're ultimately talking about, you know, the mass that we're moving. And, you know, in terms of force, like, you know, that can be, uh, the force can be then influenced by like the acceleration, which may have to do with what percentage of your maximum it is. And therefore, you know, how many repetitions, you know, can we do with it? So ultimately, you know, it's this, you know, this final appearance of something that, that we call strength that's influenced by the constraints that are predetermined within the exercise or the competition uh, rules that we've set up. And then the constraints within, you know, the individual uh, in terms of things like, you know, limb length, for example, and uh, all those other things you mentioned as far as, you know, what's the repetition range, the tempo. Uh, so ultimately, as you mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not one thing. It's simply just what we agree upon for that specific, you know, competition or, uh, you know, specific, like, task that we're undertaking. And, you know, usually in this case, we're talking about things, you know, with, uh, you know, with barbells, um, but it really could be, you know, anything from, you know, picking up a stone, or even, you know, throwing a stone, right, as the, again, as that acceleration component changes, um, usually, we're, when we're talking about strength, it's ultimately mass. So just, you know, a little bit more, again, sort of files within that cabinet that come to mind, you know, when, when we're ultimately talking about strength, um, but it, it is, you know, just made up of, of, of so many different things that, you know, we sort of amalgamate into this, this one final concept uh, that we see and we can identify and we can all generally agree upon like, yeah, that guy's strong. Um, but man, is there a lot that goes into what we, what we see in terms of the appearance of strength? Yeah. So what I'm kind of hearing is that like strength is this thing that is, um, a combination of many different variables. So it's kind of like a gross outcome rather than a specific thing. And mm -hmm. I think that that concept is really elucidated when you ask people what strength is, because normally people are like, what do you mean? You know, like, uh, yeah, strength is <laughs> strength is strength, right? It's like it's like what's sexy, right? <laughs> like what you know it when you see it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but you know, to define it, to break it down, like at the end of the day, we can't even fully elucidate all of the components that go into sexy or all the components that go into strength. But you know, strong and sexy when you see it. Wow. Yeah, that was great. I mean, we're just rolling now. You know, it's funny, you mentioned the, this concept of the cabinet, or, 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 you know, the cognitive cabinet, I like to, it's kind of like inertia, almost. It's like when you're, um, when you're kind of like, going back into your head and like digging for those files, once you kind of pull like a couple of things out, it's almost like the ball is rolling, and then the ball is much easier to push when it's already moving, you mm -hmm. know, and that kind of happens in conversation too. 
Um, so just kind of starting from one example, uh, just to be concrete, and it's very recent, um, to kind of uh, say this a little bit of a different way before we move on to the application of hypertrophy stuff. Um, you and I were doing leg curls two days ago, and uh, you did two working sets. We don't, we're not going to get into all the X's and O's of, of that. We stay steer clear of that for now. But the first set was more of like, um, you know, you were a little bit more hyped up, a little bit more of like a serious kind of focus, a little bit more of an intent to like move the weight out of the top quickly, right? And you had, for reference, you had like the full stack, uh, two additional plates on there. I was also sort of assisting on some of the concentrics, right? So you could kind of dig a little bit deeper into that set. And then after you did that set, you kind of worked toward a little bit of a different style in the second set where it was like, okay, we're going to strip some weight off, still full stack, but not the additional plates. And this set, we're really just going to concentrate on like moving a little bit slower, perhaps a little bit less, you know, assistance from me, uh, not too much of a focus on, on the tossing, inertial aspect of it. Like you weren't trying to accelerate it super fast, more just the sort of like concentrated, you know, meditative uh, experience of just like really um, eking out every sort of portion of the squeeze, if you, if you will. And so, you know, you were the same Ethan, you know, technically speaking in both scenarios, but if someone were to just watch either one of those sets, they would say, Ethan is this strong versus Ethan is this strong. But in reality, yeah. Ethan wasn't, you know, Ethan didn't get X amount of percentage points necessarily weaker. It's like all these things around your intent in terms of, again, how fast you were moving, um, what you were really trying to do at the set, the goal was was different. So both cases, it's a leg curl, right? But the, the visual outcome of that thing that is moving on the stack is is very different. So I think that's a good example um, to kind of illustrate that. Did you have anything you want to, to add on that? Yeah, you know, if we were to use a proxy like, say, volume load in terms of like, you know, the reps times the weight I was using, I used more weight and I did more reps in the first set. Of course, going into the second set, you know, I'm coming in with some fatigue. I might expect to drop off. You know, if I did, you know, 20 reps on the first set, maybe the second rep would second set would be like, you know, 14, 15 reps, something like that. Um, but it was that, and it was also a decrease in load. And one of the biggest things, uh, as you mentioned, that change was just that uh, inertial intent, like that, you know, uh, throwing of of the weight in the beginning, which changes you know where those those peak forces exist um and you know just knowing that um you know close to competition and you know having a lot of peak force you know in that length and position especially with that sort of a tent is just not something you know i want a super high volume of right now you know i want to ideally be able to maintain some of these uh you know components of, of, of this thing we call strength but at the end of the day, like strength is not the goal. It's really just like a proxy for, you know, maintaining muscle mass. So at sometimes I want to have the ability to display that that is still there, you know, as, as a measure, but it's not necessarily the thing that's driving adaptations for me. So a set, you know, with a significantly different sort of intent, uh, different sort of acceleration forces and, you know, uh, place at different points in the range of motion you know, can still have the same stimulus, but not necessarily be like the same proxy and tell me where I am in terms of my strength and therefore maybe, uh, you know, muscle mass at that point. Right. Yeah. So, and I think a good takeaway from that is just, if you change anything about the force scenario, it's like you're kind of comparing apples to oranges, even though it could be the exact same exercise, you know, from, from a gross perspective. Okay. Yeah, and just that like, you know, testing strength and improving strength are not the same thing. Mm. So in that, like you can display that you are getting stronger, but the way that you display that you're getting stronger is not, doesn't have to be the same way that you get stronger. Right. Right. Yeah. To that old point of like, you can't do more than you can do. Right. But like people still get stronger, not doing more than they can do. You know, your bench press max goes up even, even though you're not doing more than you're already doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or just that, like you can, um, you know, you can do something to create an adaptation that isn't necessarily the exact thing that demonstrates that that adaptation, uh, exists. And like we mentioned, all those components of, you know, load tempo, et cetera. 
um, rep range. You know, you could train, you know, with five reps and improve your one RM, but you can't necessarily be sure that your one RM has improved without, you know, testing your one RM. So just that there's a difference between testing and, uh, you know, and create in and, and sort of like creating a stimulus to drive an adaptation and that those adaptations are also pretty specific in terms of like, you know, strength versus hypertrophy as well. So you don't want to get too caught up in saying, oh, this thing is a proxy for that other thing. Therefore, I need to constantly test if that proxy is improving to the point where you may actually be sacrificing the improvement and the goal that you actually have by trying to just move a proxy, in this case, strength, uh, you know, to the detriment of hypertrophy. Right. So kind of moving then into our goals of like, I want to grow muscle. I think a lot of people, as you're saying, will kind of conflate getting stronger with gaining more muscle. And I think there's obviously a lot, there's like, there's a clear relationship between those two things. You know, on average, the more hypertrophied people you see that the stronger on average across all exercises, they tend to be. Um, but I think problems start to arise when we start to maybe, uh, we'll say sacrifice quality for the addition of load or, or for, um, you know, for doing, um, you know, additional load within the context of a single workout by, by changing execution to where, you know, now we're no longer maybe targeting a specific tissue. Maybe we're doing something, um, we're, we're doing something different in terms of, uh, our, our control over the load. So I think that that point about the different four scenarios is really important for people to keep in mind. So when we talk about this in the context of of hypertrophy, um, I'll, I'll kind of start by just by just saying that I think it's very, very important and also underrated. This is this is one of those things I often reference, like, you know, how a lot of perspectives for me shifted when I when I started training with you, because in the context of hypertrophy, I just I never really paid too much attention to standardization, um, which is it's looking back on it is kind of silly. Um, but with strength training specifically, like what well, well, when I say strength training, I mean like just powerlifting training, for example, is like most people say strength training is powerlifting training, um, which we know, you know, not to be the case. Like when you're training for bodybuilding, you're obviously still training for the qualities of of strength. But in the context of powerlifting, like something that powerlifters do exceedingly well is uh, is they, they standardize very well, right? They, they focus a lot on their technique. They do the same things over and over and over again. They often, uh, you know, this is kind of a thing in powerlifting culture, but like powerlifters will even get to the point where they refuse to use a specific, um, rack or they really refuse to use any other rack in the gym that is not like their rack and their barbell. And I think there's like kind of something to that in terms of the standardization aspect of it. But powerlifters are really good at just repeating the same thing over and over and sort of measuring that across across weeks. But when it comes to hypertrophy, we have just so many different options to accomplish, you know, the goal of getting XYZ muscle bigger that you don't necessarily need to standardize across weeks to see that kind of, you know, muscle growth or to see to see the progress you want in that in that specific vector. So for me, um, measuring or or keeping track of strength is very, very useful in the context of hypertrophy training, as long as for the most part, you are standardizing what you're doing across different weeks so that you can actually compare apples to apples. And so that not, and so that you're not comparing, we'll say like these two different force scenarios where it's like one week you may have appeared to have gotten stronger, but in reality, you're just doing something totally different from a force perspective or from a muscle perspective. So um, I do think that it's very important to standardize if we are focusing on strength. Um, but I also think that to our conversation, even just last week, you know, you need to, in the context of bodybuilding, uh, I think you need to be willing to kind of pivot when something doesn't feel quite right and, and not sort of continuing to push along that standardized route when it's maybe not working for you anymore, or you're experiencing discomfort or pain or whatever. So um, in terms of like, you know, how you conceptualize uh, strength in 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 your program? Um, I'm interested to kind of, and I'll and I'll make this specific for you. Like, I'm interested to kind of know um, how your how your perspective on strength has shifted. Like, the stronger that you've gotten, uh, if, if that kind of makes sense, because I feel like for me, 
Um, at, at one point, it was like, if I wasn't progressing in strength, I was wasting my time, right? But now it's kind of more like, if I don't progress every single week, I'm not too concerned about it, as long as I'm sort of getting what I perceive to be like an effective stimulus for that that week. So um, kind of, uh, I guess, a little bit of a vague question of like, how important is strength to you at this point? Um, but I guess maybe the more specific question is like, is is getting stronger every single week at this point something that you're super concerned about um or is it something that is kind of like this byproduct of you know you just kind of doing the same exercises over and over and as long as it's not going backwards it's kind of it's kind of like something that is is okay in your in your head if that kind of framing makes sense yeah i mean i just look at it in terms of what is my expectation for the phase that I'm in or the person that I'm working with? You know, so it, I do expect to see actually like performance gains, you know, week over week at a time where I'm building muscle, you know, at a fairly rapid rate. You know, if that's someone else, maybe that's a beginner, maybe they're not a beginner, but they just haven't been doing things quite as well. And now I'm working with them for the first time. Maybe it's an introduction of a new exercise early on, you know, with an introduction of a new exercise or a new person, like there is a lot of just like tweaking in terms of technique. And, you know, the number one thing isn't seeing the number go up, but I do expect in the back of my mind to see numbers go up once I've really nailed, you know, a standardization to things. So I'm not, as I've mentioned before, I don't necessarily look at the reps from the week before and say, I have to beat it this week. That is the goal. It's just simply that if I am progressing at a rapid rate, it is my expectation that I will see progress uh, for me, you know, pretty much week over week. Now, typically I don't progress load. I, I uh, you know, as a first measure typically i progress reps you know in kind of a double progression scheme so i minimize like i tend to live on the slightly higher rep range than most people because i can use a lot of weight for many things and um i've just found it to be more sustainable to let reps increase week over week and it also t it tends to be a nice standardization process as you mentioned like if i keep everything the same and last week i got 15 reps on the first set and then this week i got 16 you know, of course, there could be a lot of moving variables as far as tempo, et cetera. But when you see that happen week over week, and then you increase load and the reps start going up again, I'm just looking at a trend over time, you know, so much like I would evaluate, say, sleep data, for example, like, if I wear an aura ring at night, I don't check back the next morning to see like, oh, did what I did last night affect, you know, my my REM sleep or my sleep efficiency or something like that but I'll look at the long-term data trends and I might say oh man this week I'm getting to bed an hour later like you know maybe something in my schedule changed and let me just reflect back on you know the general trend that things are moving in versus trying to affect it moment to moment same thing with the body weight right you're not weighing yourself throughout the day as you're eating you're not necessarily weighing yourself you know every morning and thinking back on you know what do i need to do today versus yesterday but uh, if your goal is to build muscle like you probably want to see a general upward trend over time in proportion to the rate that you expect to make progress you know so if you're a beginner eating in a hypercaloric state or someone, you know, becoming enhanced for the first time or what have you, there are reasons why you might expect to see faster rates of change, you know, than other times. So as I mentioned before, you know, you set a destination and you have an expected, you know, trajectory for that destination or in sort of speed that you aim to accomplish it in. And you're just comparing back to your, your expectations. Now I might have clients that have been training for decades and, you know, aren't in a specific, you know, growth period where I do expect that rate of change to be fairly slow. And I set up their progression in a way where maybe it takes months for them to actually like be able to detect a change in progress. You know, maybe it's a double progression where, you know, they use 50 pounds for 10, 11, 12 reps. And then next time they come back, you know, once they've gotten all of their sets, you know, 50, three sets of 12, 
then maybe all we do is go up to, you know, 42 now for 10. And it's like, is that 42 for 10 better than, you know, or, or sorry, the 52 for 10 better than that, you know, 50 for three sets of 12? No, it's probably worse. But over another few months, now they're doing, you know, 52 for three sets of 12 versus, you know, the 50. And then the next time I probably can't go up to 55 you know, maybe I have to just, you know, change that rep range again. And now it's starting at nine reps instead of 10 reps, you know, so it, be, it becomes finding creative ways to match the rate of progression with the expectation you have about that person in, under the context that they're currently in. So me personally, even at seven weeks out right now, just based on how things are dialed in, I'm making progress as fast now performance wise as I was in the off season even with the same exercises for the same rep ranges, but everything's really dialed in at this point. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm, you know, ecstatic to see that sort of progression. It wasn't necessarily what I expect, but it tells me that things are in a really good place. And I'm, I'm likely still gaining muscle at this point. Yeah. So I kind of want to stay on that topic just for a little bit in terms of like this whole bulking and, and, and cutting thing and the expectations that come along with it. Because a really common question is like, should you lose strength during a cut? You know, uh, and I, I would say that, you know, likely depends uh, on a lot of things. But as you mentioned, it doesn't really seem like we've, we've seen that with you. It doesn't seem like that's been your experience. Um, and I think a big part of that reason has a lot to do with just the fact that um you know you're doing the same things every week um you're really dialed in with the nutrition and the sleep you know you train at the same times you train at the same places you know you're you 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 kind of um really put a high priority on just making sure things are sort of like one to one compar comparable week to week and i think that a lot of times what happens uh to people like during during cutting phases Assuming that like they're, uh, you know, using an appropriate rate of progression in terms of the weight loss stuff, and they're not just being stupid and cutting out like 90% of their calories. Um, I, I think that a lot of times um, people will observe an acute dip in, in strength or an acute change in strength as something that is directly reflective of, of their progress. And um, so there are certain times in which um, you know, losing strength, I think over a longer period of time would, would probably be, you know, a, a net negative sign or, or a bad sign. But I don't think that like you're saying in relationship to weight loss and weight gain, it's particularly useful to on like a day-to-day -day basis or a week to week basis, make really broad claims that come about from like very specific changes that occur in, in a program. So st sticking with the whole bulking and cutting thing. Um, I think that, when we are in a in a in a weight gain phase where we have you know a lot of resource to be able to put on muscle a lot of resource to be able to use higher volumes or whatever just more total stress it makes sense to me that you should expect um a rate of of strength gain like you're saying over time generally speaking do you think it is something that in general people should expect to lose strength or you know over the course of like let's say like a 16 week weight loss phase or a 12 week weight loss phase or do you think that um, at the very least we should we should be able to sort of maintain um, numbers, uh, you know, from week one to week sixteen, having uh, gone through this process of weight loss? Do you think that it's a a clear indication that something is going wrong if you're losing substantial amounts of strength, or do you think that you know, and we'll talk about natural versus enhanced in in a little bit here. But, you know, for the average natural lifter, do you think that um, maintaining strength across a weight loss block is something that they should look to do? Uh, or do you think that the expectation should be for most people that those num those numbers continue to climb in, in terms of strength? How do you kind of, where are your expectations at in terms of that specific archetype of, of person? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's about being pedantic and saying like, well, you know, technically, um, you know, this should be the case, you know, but sometimes on this podcast, what I try to do is just get right to the point instead of being like, okay, here are the technicalities of like what should happen. I just go to the point of like, who do I actually think is listening? What's the reality for most people in terms of what I just have observed training people and having training partners over time? So here's the reality, which is most people are not dieting for a competition. 
and they're not getting down to levels of body fat and accumulating levels of fatigue that, you know, are pushing them to the point where it becomes nearly impossible, you know, to make progress. That is a reality, but it's probably not a reality for you. Um, the reality for you is much like the volume conversation, which is like, well, should I increase, should I decrease volume, you know, going into a quote unquote cut, you know, or diet, um, you don't know where you're at, like in an absolute terms, if you were at the absolute peak of what you could adapt to, uh, in an off season where you had higher calories, then you would say, yes, technically you should reduce it. If you have less resources to recover from that. However, you don't know where you are on that spectrum. You can't just assume that you are at your maximum. And also the maximum in terms of what you can recover from versus what you can adapt to are also different. So we're not always measuring adaptation. A lot of times we're, we're measuring, you know, your ability to survive something, your ability to recover from something, your ability to, you know, um, show the appearance of, you know, changes in strength. And as we mentioned, a lot of things can affect that and, you know, volume, you know, being one of them. But I think in terms of the context, again, of the people that are listening, most people are not dieting down to the point where it's almost requisite that strength then be sort of like something that you see being maintained or even, you know, a slight decrement at the end. Um, what I see in reality is, the things that really drive, you know, um, you know, whether it be the adaptation of hypertrophy or the representation of that in strength is really just how dialed in, uh, you know, they are in terms of their behaviors. So a lot of times what actually happens is people start dieting and the quality, you know, of those behaviors, you know, goes up, they're eating better, and, you know, qualitatively, you know, and consistency wise, like they're, you know, hyper motivated because they're looking better. They've, you know, designed a life that, you know, ideally would be like, you know, present, uh, you know, in a bulking phase as well. But so much of just what drives this stuff is just a person's, you know, desire, right? It's kind of like the lab effect where you take, you know, quote unquote, trained person into a lab, and all of a sudden, they're getting gains that don't exist in the real world. And it's because, you know, they have these researchers around them, who, you know, themselves are oftentimes competitors, highly motivated, you know, it's not, you know, gone are the days where these are, you know, endurance researchers or people that don't lift weights themselves, like these are people like you and I, in the lab, who, literally are dedicating their lives, you know, to this, uh, you know, pursuit, not just physically, but mentally as well. So they tend to be good coaches who are hyper motivated, they got loud music on. And I think what really, you know, drives, you know, progress at the end of the day, tends to be those type of factors. So the reality is most people when they start dieting, if they are hyper motivated, everything improves, despite the fact that technically their calories are lower. Yes, technically your recovery is worse, but that's assuming that you were at maximum before. And since no one is really, you know, at maximum year round, once you start turning those other dials, it's like, yeah, your maximum ability to adapt goes down, but you were never there. Mm. So it tends to be that you actually do still see, you know, performance, you know, increase, especially if you're, you know, writing a new program, you know, going into this block where there's some, you know, learning coming into it. So I don't want to, you know, necessarily encourage people, you know, to set up a paradigm that is centered around the need to see performance go up, you know, because if you say, all right, well, I'm just going to decrease volume and create a powerlifting program for a diet so that I can see my performance going up, that's the wrong idea. At the end of the day, the adaptation we're after is still hypertrophy. We've talked, you know, before about, you know, the things that go into driving that adaptation. You don't want to lose that concept to drive the appearance of strength gains. But at the end of the day, like I do tend to just see overall better results when people are in a state where things are just dialed in and they're, they're hyper motivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to the conversation then around like how this can, you know, affect uh, different people at different stages differently, meaning, you know, the absolute beginner versus the person who's on the IFBB stage. I tend to find that, first of all, to your point, uh, the person who is 
curious about this, uh, just from a just a just from a pure curiosity perspective, is usually not the person who is an absolute beginner or someone who is super advanced. Usually, both of those people are kind of ignoring this conversation on average, uh, just because they're either focused on different things, or um, you know, in the case of the advanced person, maybe they're kind of just prioritizing those behaviors, and the strength is almost like more so a byproduct that comes along with all those behaviors feeding into each other. And then the person that's an absolute beginner, a lot of times is just not necessarily checking the boxes for adaptation in terms of lifestyle, nutrition, sleep, that would even necessitate this conversation to begin with. So kind of to your point, I feel like this is a conversation that sort of applies to people mostly at some point in the middle, but even the people in the middle, I think really need to double down on, on those variables that you're describing. And a lot of times the strength is almost something that occurs as this sort of second, third order consequence of checking the boxes of consistency and nutrition, sleep, and, 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 and all those things. So I think that, and this is a kind of an interesting thing to me, which is that oftentimes in terms of like rate of adaptation of strength, you see similar patterns at the extremes, you know, so you see, um, like in the absolute beginner, you don't really even need to, at least I personally with clients never really needed to pay too much attention to actually forcing progression. It was kind of just like the strength just came as a consequence of them just regularly exposing themselves to any form of, of exercise and any improvement in, in technique within a particular exercise. And then interestingly, like looking at your training and looking at the rate of progression that you often see, let's say like with a new exercise, it's like week one, um, you know, for example, uh, our weights will sort of be within at least, um, at, at least like within a distance that I can conceptualize. So if I'm using a hundred pounds on a chest press on week one, and we're both, you and I are both new to the exercise, you might be using, you know, 50% more load, 40% more load, 30% more load, but then it's kind of like by week two, I maybe add five to 10 pounds and you're adding like 20 to 30, right? The scale of progression is just totally different. And so I think that's, that's an interesting thing to see, which is like at the extremes, you see this really, really highly scaled magnitude of change across new exercises or just across exposure to similar variations, maybe that you haven't done before, but then somewhere in the middle of those extremes, like with the intermediate person, with the person who's maybe been doing that, you know, the same exercises for a while, it tends to sort of level off. And I do find that, you know, um, as you're saying, um, even in the advanced person, it obviously does level off and the rate of progression will, will slow. Um, so I kind of think about this too, um, from the perspective of like strength increases and speaking to the whole conversation of like, just changing the force scenarios and stuff like that, introducing a new exercise, you know, or, or a novel exercise to someone's program is a really easy way to, uh, sort of see that strength progression in, in any, in any exercise, doesn't really matter what, what group it is, or even if they've been training those groups for a long time, if it's a new skill, it's kind of like the adaptations will, will be magnified in relationship to that new skill or that new exposure. But what oftentimes happens, I feel like is, and this is where I think the exercise hopping, you know, trend comes from is just for people to kind of continue to see those adaptations at that same rate, they need to constantly be doing different things. And I think that's where people work themselves into maybe we'll say a not so good place where it's like they're continuing to see those strength increases, but they're kind of going nowhere because nothing is really standardized. Um, so I, I think that the whole standardization piece is such a big, big, big part of it. And I do find that, like you're saying, a lot of variables change that have nothing to do with, um, you know, the person's rate of progression in terms of hypertrophy necessarily, but more so just all of the more superficial things that come along with how strength can sort of change across um, scenarios. So, you know, when we start to talk about this in terms of like, because a lot of people, even, even if they're not competitive uh, people or they're not, they're not pro bodybuilders and they're not like super, super interested in all this stuff, there often still is the question of like, well, how is this different uh, between, you know, the natural person who's been training for five plus years and then the enhanced person who has been training for five plus years. Uh, and I'm kind of interested in, in, in your perspective on the differences that um, you have seen in your training in terms of this whole strike thing between now and sort of where you're at right now with your with your bodybuilding stage 
and then where you were maybe five to 10 years ago um, when, when you were uh, an, a natural athlete, how has your sort of, if it has, how has the sort of framework for you around strength changed between those two sort of natural versus enhanced um, scenarios? And is it something that's really even that different for you in your conceptualization? Or is it something that is, is drastically different, like a lot of people will, will claim for it to be? No, it, it wasn't really that different for me. You know, mm. or most of the people I work with now are still uh, natural. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of what I observe, you know, I guess it's still pretty similar. I mean, I, I would like to say, oh, yeah, you know, a lot of the enhanced guys will just kind of like show up and, you know, just do, you know, train by feel that day. Like, you know, not really measure anything and just come in and, you know, just like, you know, train hard. And as long as, you know, they're eating enough, taking enough, you know, they grow. But the reality is like, it's the same in the natural community, you know, for a long time, a lot of the natural guys still trained each body part, you know, once a week, we're still kind of on that bro split, still grew just fine. You know, you still see, you know, plenty of people training with hit, you know, in the natural crowd and, you know, also with high volume and it's really just all over the board, man. Like you see guys, you know, that grow enhanced by training, you know, kind of for the pump and, you know, just really light and just, you know, doing super high volume. And then, you know, again, on the other side, you know, training with, you know, high relative intensity, close to failure. Um, so I think, man, the training just like totally runs uh, the gamut, whether, you know, it's enhanced or natural. And at the end of the day, like, you know, the person's genetics, you know, really are kind of the driving factor on how much muscle they grow even, you know, independent of, of the strength side of things. Right. Hmm. You know, like there are some pretty weak, you know, relatively weak guys. Like I, w when I was natural, like I would still train with enhanced people and be able to keep up, um, you know, and I'm because like, I don't train with the mindset at this point of just like moving the most total load. Um, there are things that I do that don't appear to be, you know, super, super heavy, um, as you know, most things still kind of do, but if you know the context of it, you're like, oh yeah, like that isn't insane, but oh, he's doing 20 reps with it, like, or it's last in the workout and it's, you know, 20 reps. When you put all the context together, like I've had, you know, Hans guys walk up to me in the gym and be like, oh, you don't, you know, train super heavy, do you? But if you know, like the context of everything in terms of, again, where it falls in the workout what the tempo I'm using is, what the rep range, all that, like, it's still pretty difficult, but, um, no, I, I don't think in general, it changes that much, uh, to be honest, between, you know, and enhanced and natural, uh, specifically on the strength side, I think on the hypertrophy side, for sure, like being able to measure changes, uh, in hypertrophy is something that's much easier to do in terms of just the absolute magnitude on the enhanced side where using something like skin folds you know pictures circumference like that's pretty hard you know week to week or month to month you know with a natural guy who's been training for a long time but you take an enhanced guy and you measure you know skin fold pictures you know week to week um you know or month to month like it tends to be that you can observe that adaptation a little bit easier which is pretty cool because that's ultimately what we care about Whereas, you know, maybe the one difference with the natural is it's a little bit easier to use like performance as that proxy um, versus, you know, just going directly to what we care about. Right. And sort of the reason that's the case, just to, just to make sure I'm hearing that right, is like in the enhanced situation, the rate of change visually that you're seeing is so much more rapid that that is almost like a you can use this kind of a clearer proxy, whereas the rate of change in a natural being much slower, it's it's helpful to use this kind of adjacent thing mm -hmm. as the thing that you're measuring to make sure that you're still moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I do tend to think the magnitude of difference hypertrophy wise is greater enhanced right it's like you know when you talk about the biggest natural guys on stage you know maybe 200 pounds you know and those aren't the guys that are you know winning right it's like the best guys are maybe like the middleweight guys you know they're 170 something pounds on stage so there's literally a hundred pound difference you know between the best 
enhanced guys, you know, and the best natural guys on stage. And you can't even like you. Yeah. That's more than, you know, like a 50% increase in their body weight. But remember their body weight is made up of bone mass, organ mass, you know, fluid, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So in terms of contractile tissue, like the magnitude in overall, you know, mass of contractile tissue is just orders of magnitude different. Uh, I don't think it's the same in regards to strength. And, you know, some of the strongest, you know, enhanced bodybuilders, like, you know, Ronnie Coleman, for example, you know, he was, you know, he was still doing reps, you know, with 700 pounds on the deadlift, you know, before he ever became, you know, enhanced much later in his career. So I do think the magnitude of hypertrophy is actually a little greater than the magnitude of difference, you know, in strength. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, and I think to kind of give a little bit of credence to uh, the the importance of strength, I think I personally went through a phase where I was a little bit more extreme about this in terms of just strength is something that's it's so often talked about and it's so often prioritized and it's looked at as like you know the the most important thing in a in a training context or at least that's how a lot of people communicate it so I for a little while went just so anti that I tend to be uh, super contrarian in that sense where when most people I, I are saying I noticed that in our conversations where like <laughs> we do I think differ a little bit on that context where a lot of times we're talking about you know rate of progression over a block and a lot of times it's for you it ends up being like no we need to focus you know more on just like um observing that quality week to week and i agree like i think we need to standardize that that but at the end of the day i do tend to lean more on the side of we should observe you know changes over time and when we don't i don't tend to see people making a lot of progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm definitely more sort of leaning in that direction. Um, you know, nowadays, I think I've come back to a little bit more of a sensible, um, a sensible middle ground. And, you know, I also think that for the person who is, you know, even pretty, pretty much any stage of, of intermediate, I do think that um, something that's maybe less talked about just because it's not as trendy in the context of like talking about this from a science perspective is strength and like gaining strength in the gym, at least for me. And I think a lot of other people is really like a powerful motivator, you know, like in the initial phases. So we, we can get to a point where, um, strength is this thing that is like all consuming. And if I'm not making progress that I'm, you know, in, if I'm not making progress in strength and I'm not making progress anywhere, we can get into that mindset. And then we can get into the mindset that like, I need to start to toss things or do things differently or set this up in a way where I'm able to lift more just for the sake of it. But I do feel like a lot of times that does come from a good place of like, this is the thing that was really driving me and making me look forward to training. And I think that's something that, um, I think I kind of, I maybe got a little bit, um, you know, I just lost that priority for a little bit, uh, for a little while. Uh, and, and, and so it, it kind of was something that was not as sort of toward the forefront of my mind. And I, and I do think that I just personally had a bad experience with, uh, power lifting from an injury standpoint. And so basically any, any time where I started to push a little bit more, um, maybe when I shouldn't have just for the sake of putting more weight on the bar, you know, I saw a negative consequence for that. So it's kind of like I was jumping in, in, into the opposite direction, not for the best, um, not for the best reasons. But I do think that as a, um, as a metric, just to get people excited, I do think it is a very powerful motivator. And it definitely was for me when I was just first getting into training. And I think that that's, it's, it's a, it starts off as something good, but I think as long as you kind of contextualize it as you become more trained, um, it's something that stays important, but is not really the primary motivator. It's more like that motivation is a lot more intrinsic and you're not really like um, getting excitement from, you know, adding a two and a half to the bar or or adding a little bit more weight on, on the pin. It's more like you have this broader goal of like, am I getting bigger over time? You can think longer term. And so these more acute shifts in performance become less relevant in the scope and, you know, in the grand scheme of like the framework that you have and the perspectives that you've, um, the perspectives that you've gained. 
And I just wow. come back to like, you know, setting a realistic goal. Like if you start with the appropriate trajectory in terms of like your rate of progress, what should be satisfying is meeting that goal, but it just needs to be appropriate for mm. where you're at, you know? So I, I think you can be excited about whatever that goal is that you set and in the beginning, you know, it might move a little faster, but no matter what, like, as long as you're advancing somewhere, you know, it doesn't matter what that thing is. Maybe you're, you're working on a, a technique and it's more of a quality qualitative thing. Maybe the overall performance, you know, um, goal that you set for a year is much smaller than it used to be, but no matter what it is, like make that goal exciting and relevant to you. And it's just, achieving you know what you set out to do rather than just saying like uh looking at it day to day and setting that goal day to day if you set it more broadly and realistically to begin with you can be excited about the fact that you met what you set out to do yeah and i think an important caveat here in the context of like hypertrophy training is it's super obvious to people when uh they are or aren't making progress in a motion like a barbell bench press for example um, and when you sort of stall out on a barbell bench press or a back squat or a barbell deadlift, um, you know, it, it tends to be like the stall happens over a longer period of time. It, it becomes more obvious to you that you're feeling generally more fatigued, but when you have so many options in bodybuilding and you have so many different exercises with highly differing absolute loads, um, I think it becomes very important to make those goals specific to exercises. Um, and you know, we, we've used, I used an example a ton of times, but like with, you know, with dumbbell lateral raise, you can't expect to just be jumping dumbbells, you know, every single week, you need to make sure that you scale the relative progression to, to the exercise itself and to the absolute load um, itself. And so a lot of people, when they say like, oh, I've stalled out on, on this exercise, a lot of times it ends up just being the case that the relative progressions that they're making are, are way too big or are um, you know, more, uh, more appropriate for something like a, a, a big, you know, absolute load motion, like a barbell squat bench or deadlift, where, you know, you can make those incremental changes pretty, pretty easily over time. But when it comes to, you know, picking up a 10 pound dumbbell and then trying to add five more pounds, all of a sudden it's a, it's a different story. So I think it's important to um, have that framework, but just for each exercise individually, sort of speaking to where we started with just the skill specific, um, quality of, of strength and, and how, um, you should really make sure that exercise to exercise, you're not trying to, um, you know, make these similar sort of absolute load jumps, uh, and that you're really, you know, contextualizing each, ex each exercise as a sort of like own, um, you know, individual thing, uh, over the course of, you know, a block or, or several blocks or, or whatever. Um, so the, I kind of wanted to, sort of finish up by by talking a little bit about the um the dark side of of strength I, I which i alluded to a little bit earlier but you know you're someone who relatively speaking is very strong and there are consequences or problems that you can run into with using a lot of absolute load on a lot of different exercises and even for someone who is you know a natural even if they're relatively very very strong you know compared to their body weight a lot of times natural people don't have the the same sorts of issues like orthopedically just in terms of the total load that they're using um and i have heard it said that absolute load is not a, a big player when it comes to injury risk and i don't i, I don't tend to agree with that. Uh, I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit of a silly thing to say, because the logic is kind of like, oh, you know, if you're this strong and you can handle this load, then like, you know, it, it shouldn't really matter whether you're doing six reps or whether you're doing 20 reps. Um, yeah. You know, the absolute load is not that important. So do, do you have, do you have thoughts on the whole absolute load thing and where you kind of tend to want to reduce it or where you tend to not worry about it as much? Yeah. I mean, Look, I mean, number one, you know, there's multiple systems. As we said, strength is an amalgam of things. It's not just one thing that's being done by one system, right? Like, yeah, there's muscular adaptations, there's connective tissue adaptations, there's adaptations to the nervous system, there's adaptations, you know, to, uh, you know, even cardiovascularly in terms of supplying uh, blood flow, you know, so you think... No, number one that like just because one of those systems has adapted doesn't mean they've all come up to par 
and that the consequences just, you know, move linearly. They definitely don't. You can observe uh, both chronically in really strong people. Uh, they take much more time, you know, between uh, heavy sessions, you know, an, an elite power lifter is not, you know, doing their maximum deadlift at the same frequency that, you know, a novice would be. Uh, and then on an acute scale, it takes them much longer to recover between sets. If you said it was all equal, then someone who could squat, you know, 600 for reps would need to rest just as long as someone who is squatting hundred for reps. And it's clearly not the case whatsoever. Um, I would also just say, you know, we've talked a lot about these sort of big three lifts, you know, squat, bench, and deadlifts, because we're kind of going back and forth between powerlifting and bodybuilding. It does seem that these, you know, um, sort of acute drops in weight, like just, you know, start of a diet, you drop off maybe some initial water weight, you make it a, a relatively larger change, maybe calorically at the beginning of a diet than you do later on in a diet. And it does seem like people who have been doing those big three lifts for a long time, who have acquired a lot of skill, who are able to use a lot of internal, you know, you do an exercise like the big, like these uh, big three, where there's a lot of internal bracing required, that it's more common to see performance decrements in something like that than it would be whether you call it a less skill or more externally braced exercise, you know, like a machine. So it is important in the context of, you know, observing performance changes in a diet um, that it tends to be my, my experience is people experience less decrement when it comes to doing, um, you know, the type of exercises I just described that are more externally braced, less skill based. Um, and I think that is, you know, generally a good direction to sort of lean in when it comes to, you know, hypertrophy training, uh, you know, on a cut. But um, yeah, you know, two separate things there, but I think I tackled that first question, which is, um, you know, when it comes to, um, when it comes to strength, you know, does absolute load matter in terms of whether it be acute recovery or chronic recovery? And I think undoubtedly um, you can see in practice that it does. So we can't say that the conclusion then is that like, we can't say, cause I've seen this go too far in the opposite direction too. And I personally have taken the stance at a number of times where we can't, we shouldn't say that like use as, use as little load as possible. Right. And like get the same stimulus. Like it's not that like less load is therefore better or less injurious, but the point is just more so that clearly there is a distinction between um, being someone who is on average much, much stronger and someone who is on average much, much weaker relative to that person. So I think making sure that that context is um, is made explicit in, in your particular case, I wouldn't say that for the average person, they should be super concerned with like, what is the absolute load on this thing and how do I reduce it to get the same stimulus? But I do think that it is, it is useful to have at least as a sort of tool in your toolbox to go back to the example earlier of like the first leg curl set versus the second leg curl set. It's good to be able to, I think, choose both of those different options and choose both of those different tents, depending on, you know, what you need on a given, on a given day or, or, or within the context of a, of, of a specific program. So I, I think that an interesting question that, that comes from that is like, in what, and we can kind of finish up with this. What in what cases do you feel like um, you pay more attention to the absolute loading thing, and in what cases do you find that it's not as much of a concern? Just for you personally, not sort of speaking generally, but just in terms of like the absolute loading conversation. Are there certain categories of exercises that you are more cognizant of that in, and certain exercises that you, that you are less concerned about it in, or is it kind of all sort of like a similar theme across, you know, a curl to a hack squat to you know a leg press, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it does matter, but I guess it just matters, you know, for different reasons. It's usually just like a practical constraint, right? Like, you know, when we talk about load in a relative sense, we're really just talking about how many reps are you doing? You know, when you're saying, if, if you're controlling for effort, you know, so doing really high reps on something like a squat, you know, is going to you know come with a lot of like systemic fatigue if i did that 
you know, earlier on in a training session that might affect, you know, exercises that fall afterwards. Um, in terms of exercise order, you know, I tend to put those things, you know, later in a training session. Um, but I think, you know, there are, there do end up, there does end up being so many different variables that go, that go into like, where is it fatiguing? You know, is it fatiguing, you know, more systemically because I'm doing, you know, a big multi-joint lift? Is it something, you know, from an absolute load standpoint, um, that I'm more concerned with from an injury standpoint at the end of the day, like I, I personally am not really varying the rep ranges too much, you know, from exercise to exercise. I do think there are plenty of cases where it makes a lot of sense. You have to look at it on a case to case basis. But for me, I just lean, you know, slightly higher, uh, reps on, on just about everything. And I, I find that my fitness is good enough to endure that even on, um, you know, the multi-joint lifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me personally, I just tend to be a little bit more cautious on cautious might not be the right word, but just on exercises that uh, are mostly like lower body motions that are loaded substantially at the trunk. Um, and generally speaking to the, to the, you know, context of like the, the big three lifts or, or something like a barbell RDL. I'm also super uh, cognizant of that just because um, I do think that those are exercises where, you know, if you introduce, uh, uh, if you introduce one of those exercises in sort of like a novel way where you haven't done it in a while, those are the ones where you can use a ton of load, uh, right off of the bat without necessarily having those sort of secondary tertiary systems, uh, adapted, to, like meaning like you may be able to lift the weight. Um, but you know, the next day it's like, you might incur some sort of, joint discomfort or, or, or weird joint fatigue that is non-muscular. And I think that that tends to be, um, those kinds of cases of like over, over sort of doing it on the first day just tend to be more like accessible to those particular exercises. It's not as if those particular exercises are more dangerous or anything, but, uh, the capacity to load, if it's greater tends to, tends to make it so that, um, you can really overshoot in that sort of like novel period of, you know, the new introduction uh, or, or the novel introduction, if it's something that you've done previously and are, and are returning to. Um, so, yeah, I just think that the more load total and the more systems involved, if we want to call it that uh, total and the more total structures that are stressed with one exercise, the more it's probably good to uh, uh, be like just a little bit more aware in those, in those cases, but you know, something like a rope curl with a cable, uh, it, it kind of hard to, to overdo it, you know, uh, on the first day. Um, all right, cool. You think we missed anything big picture? I think that was pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, if there's anything else that you wanted to add or, or subtract or, uh, further contextualize. All right. Until next week, which we will be six weeks out from competition, uh, uh, and so I think it's going to be cool as we get closer to your, uh, to your show day to kind of, um, talk about some, some things that are maybe more specific to like what you're going through right now and how that can maybe apply, uh, more, more generally. Uh, cause I think it'll be very interesting for people, uh, especially people who have listened to 30, whatever episodes to kind of see you going through this, um, phase and then post comp, we can, uh, sort of look back and, and, and talk about it. I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be cool.